Yu from the Department of Physics and Mathematics and currently a doctoral student in the area of curriculum instruction. On behalf of Old Dominion University and the RAGES team, it is my honor to serve as your moderator for this session, Atomic and Nuclear Physics, Laser Lab Tour, and Life in a Nuclear Physics Lab. The presenters of this session will provide you with a live tour of some of the labs in the Physical Science Building here at ODU. Our presenters for this lab include Dr. Sebastian Kuhn, who received his PhD at the University of Bonn in Germany, and then spent six years working at Stanford University. In 1992, he came to Odeman University, where, is he, where he is a professor of physics doing research in experimental nuclear and particle physics. Dr. Charles Sukinik, who received a bachelor's from Cornell University and a PhD from Yale in physics, following his postdoctoral appointment at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, he joined the ODU physics faculty in 1997. His current research is mainly in the area of experimental, ultra-cold, atomic, and molecular physics. Dr. Craig Callacy received his PhD in 2015 at the Frankfurt University in Germany. In 2017, he became a professor of physics at the Catholic University of America, doing research in experimental nuclear and detector physics in close collaboration with ODU. Caleb Bogler is a PhD student here at ODU with the Experimental Nuclear and Particle Physics Group. During the presentation, feel free to add questions and comments within the chat and Q&A section. Please join me in welcoming our presenters for today's lab tours. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Sebastian Kuhn, and I'll be giving a very short introduction in today's proceedings and then begin with the first part, uh, nuclear and particle physics. So you've all heard quite a bit of uh, presentations already on the most exciting research going on in many fields of physics. And we thought today we wanted to present you with uh, a more real life experience of how this research is actually done and by whom, by uh, undergraduate students, graduate students, postdocs and professors uh, here at ODU in our research facilities. And uh, on this first slide, you can see two um, of these research facilities uh, highlighted, the experimental nuclear and physics uh, group facility, which we will start with. And then later this afternoon, we will switch to um, the laser and atomic physics lab, Dr. Sukhen. So um, getting to the ODU experimental nuclear physics research, we have about uh, eight faculty members um, and three postdocs, a technician, over 12 PhD students and several undergraduate students doing research in our group every uh, every year. And uh, in the background, you see the building you're uh, located in right now on the uh, sort of on the backside of the building that you're looking at. Um, so our experiments are mostly done at Jefferson Lab and uh, we study some of the fundamental questions of uh, strong interaction physics. We want to understand um, whether we have already found all the particles that make up the universe and how these particles combine to build things like mesons, protons and neutrons, which are the building stones of all uh, nuclei, um, and uh, then the structure of these nuclei. And um, these two pictures here uh, are two examples of um, such uh, detectors that we are using at Jefferson Lab. Uh, so let me get briefly to say something about Jefferson Lab. This is a national uh, research facility uh, about half an hour away from Old Dominion University um, uh, near uh, Newport News or in Newport News, Virginia. And uh, this lab attracts uh, 1600 physicists from all over the world doing uh, fundamental research in nuclear and particle physics. Uh, so uh, we are very fortunate in the sense that we are close by. And at the same time, this also allowed us to build some major equipment that is being used at Jefferson Lab right here at Old Dominion University. Uh, you will 
hear more about Jefferson Lab if you join again, Reyes, tomorrow at 4 p.m. Uh, Wednesday, that uh, there'll be a tour of the experimental facilities there. Uh, in the more distant future, the U.S. has embarked on building a new uh, electron ion collider in Brookhaven, New York, and we are also involved uh, in the development work for that uh, machine, which you will hear about later. So uh, here are some of the detectors we have built at ODU, um, and you will see some of these devices uh, live in a few minutes. So I won't go over them, but um, the, the pictures, most of the pictures you see on the bottom uh, are taken within our lab at ODU. So uh, here's the overview of today's program. Uh, we have three presentations from the nuclear physics, uh, nuclear physics lab, and then one more um, coming from the atomic physics lab, uh, the laser lab. Uh, I should say at this point, if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A uh, as always, or you can send an email to one of these people, uh, the presenters, and we will answer them after the session ends. Uh, if you have an urgent question, type it in the Q&A and Rachel will take uh, take it from there and ask the, the, uh, the right person to answer it. So um, the first section is on, well, you can see the so-called bonus 12 uh, radial time projection chamber, which is a detector we built at ODU uh, or with, with collaboration uh, with Hampton University. And uh, this picture just shows you uh, what this detector is supposed to do. Uh, we want to study neutrons, but neutrons do not exist free in nature. So you have to use a nucleus which is made of one proton and one neutron. And the way to make sure that we hit the neutron and not the proton is by actually detecting the proton uh, coming out of the reaction. And this is what this detector uh, is custom made for. So while most of these detector Jefferson lab, as you saw, are gigantic in size, this thing actually fits on a table and you will see it in a minute. Um, here is uh, the, the, this detector as it was used inside the class 12 spectrometer at Jefferson lab last year. And although the experiment already took data and we are now analyzing those data, we still have to characterize the behavior of this detector better so we can calibrate it and, and uh, get more precise data out of it. Um, so here is a cross section of the detector. And um, if you just memorize this picture, you will see uh, the pieces uh, in a minute. Here you see one of these protons, which goes through a region of uh, helium CO2 gas. And in that region, the protons make electron ion pairs and the electrons drift outwards in a high voltage between the cathode, which is down here, and a three layer gem amplifier. And then the signals are read out on the surface of, uh, of the detector. If that all looks very strange to you right now. You will see it, uh, first of all, here in these pictures. Uh, this is the actual assembly of this detector and uh, we will now move to um, the live presentation from uh, our students and we're going to show you the pieces of this detector okay so i'm going to mute this okay so um, here you have our group of students. Uh, from the left, we have Yu Ting Hun, we have uh, Jiwan Pudel, and we have Chad Stumrau. And uh, Chad is actually going to be our first presenter, and he's going to show you the pieces of the detector, which are sitting right here. Please, Chad. Good afternoon. So right here, we have a disassembled portion of a small scale of the gas chamber itself, starting on my right to your left, we have where the gas is being flowed through from the collision to actually happen. And then this actually sits inside this piece right here, which is a bunch of copper, to where it's when the electron is flowed through the, the 
actually amplify the system in order to actually pick up the signal. Okay. And lastly, right here, we have, if you can see through here, we have a bunch of like tiny little detectors to detect that signal, that amplification process, connected to this motherboard right here, which has a bunch of signals and sensors to actually be transmitted and traveling all the way through to the oscilloscope. If you follow me over here, I can show you actually what I'm talking about. So right here is where that gas chamber is with these sensors right here. Everything is being fed through this gas chamber right here, all the way down through here. And we have the two centimeters on top and on the bottom to actually detect the cosmic rays going through it. And then over here, we have the, the, the uh, gauges to where we can take the, take the pressure, the flow, and then the other pressure right there. And then all of these signals come out and flow through these cables right here to this amplification tool. And then that way, the signal can be even amplified further to this oscilloscope where we can detect channels one, two, and three in order to see where the collision actually happened, where channels one and three are the two scintillators. And then two, uh, channel two is where if it triggers, that's where you have both of them pass them right through. And then that goes through this computer right here. Maybe we should fire then, up the high voltage for the scintillators. Yep. You okay. can see that it's already on at okay. about roughly 2,000 volts for both sides. So, do we see anything? We are currently not seeing anything right now because there's nothing going through it because we can see that. Ah, oh, there we go. There was a trigger right there, actually. Forgive me. Um, but the, and if you notice right here on the purple line, if it happens again, that's where we have that actual signal itself. So. Hang on, uh, for some reason, focus went away from this one. Okay. Let's you actually just saw a trigger body you were trying to fix that, but it should happen roughly again in the next like, 30 to seconds. Yep. Okay. Ah, there we go. There we go. So every time one of these cosmic particles that the universe provides free for us goes through these scintillators, uh, they make signals. And if they go through both the top scintillator and the bottom scintillator, we know that a particle went through our detector. And that is the detector that uh, we read out. So next. To talk about the so high when, voltage. So when we uh, know that there's a cosmic particle that goes on our detector, and we need to apply the high voltage inside the detector and make the, uh, the because when the particles interact with the gas inside the detectors, it will ionize the electron. So this ionize the electron, we need to uh, apply the high voltage and then make them come up to the, to the head and we can uh, record that we can get the signal. So here in our system, we can find the, we can control the our high voltage uh, from the from the software inside the computer. So let's turn on the voltage at this moment and you can see that right now the all the high voltage that applied to the our detector is breaking up until the the voltage that we want to uh, that we want to get. So once uh, so once we have uh, you know uh, once we set up the high voltage, then we can fix. Uh, we can capture the number of electrons inside of the system. After that, uh, the signal once we can get a signal and uh, put it to the our electronics, then our electronics will come up to the to send send out the, the information to the computer, and then we can uh, based on the our footprints to. And, uh, how much signal we can get. So this one is the main uh, program that we are uh, looking right now. So if we, once we 
we uh, get the one uh, past midway uh, from somewhere, then here we have uh, the counter with plus one. So let me just show you that if once we got a signal, then the signal will look like this one. So obviously that here has the peak uh, uh, at this moment, which uh, can give us some proof that uh, indeed we get some signal uh, from, uh, which is come from the outside. We should maybe say that each one of these columns corresponds to a time span of one eighth of a millionth of a second, 120 nanoseconds. And so we see that most of the time there's no signal. And then when the cosmic ray goes through the detector, we get a spike. These are the spikes that we then can analyze to quantify the behavior of the detector. Okay, I think that's all we have to show here. And uh, let's go and move over to Caleb Fogler and Florian. All right, can you hear us and can you see us? I think you can. Yes, Hello. we're good. All right. All right. My name is Caleb Fogler. I'm a PhD student here at Old Dominion University. I'm here to talk about scintillators, what they're made of, how they work, and how we build and use them in experiments. So a scintillator consists of scintillant material, a photomultiplier tube or PMT, and a light guide to connect them. Now we can have various different types of material in the scintillant, or we can, in this case, we actually have a plastic scintillator brick, but we can also have liquid, organic, and crystal, but they all work the same. When a charged particle, such as an electron or a proton, passes through the scintillant, it excites the atomic electrons inside the material. When these electrons de excite, they produce photons, which are particles of light. Now, these photons go in every direction inside the scintillant. So some of them, they will hit the edge of the scintillator at a high angle and thus escape. But some of them will bounce off the edge when they hit it at a low angle. And those ones will travel down it like a light in a fiber optic cable. And they will travel their way to the PMT. Now the PMT, or photomultiplier tube, that converts the light into a readable electrical signal. So here we have the innards of a PMT. And so how it works is when the photon hits the photocathode, which you see here, it produces uh, electrons by the photoelectric effect. These electrons are then accelerated by an electric field to a dynode. And when they hit that dynode, they produce more electrons. And that electric field accelerates those electrons to the next dynode produce even more electrons. And this continues until all the electrons reach the anode where the electrical signal is sent to our readout electronics, where then we can read the signal. Now we can attach the PMT directly to the scintillant, but this can lead to problems in some cases, such as this one, because we have a square face of the scintillant, but a round face to the PMT. So we will lose some photons in the corners. So to make this have it work, we use a light guide. The light guide is made up of an optically clear material such as plexiglass, and it funnels the photons from the sunlight to the PMT. Now I mentioned that we lose some electrons when they hit the edge at a high angle. We can reflect these electrons back into the sunlight if we use a reflexive material like ESR. Now we're trying to detect very few photons produced by charged particles going through the scintillant. So we need to keep out all the electric, all the photons outside of the scintillator. And so to do that, we use an opaque material like Tedlar, and we wrap the scintillator up in that, so that light will come in. So that is all the components for a scintillator, but now we need to build it. So what we do is we need to glue the scintillant with the light guides and PMTs together. Then we need to wrap it with both the reflective material and then the opaque material. So as an example for one detector we built called BAN, what we did is we first took the 
light guide and the king T, and we optically glued them together, which as you can see here, we had to clamp them together because it took the glue about a day to cure. So we then had to carefully clamp them together to cure in that time. But then we then take the light guide and PMT assembly and we attach it to the sunlight. We actually used a UV cure optical glue. And this one took only a few seconds to cure. But we had to wear special goggles, otherwise we blind ourselves with the UV light. Now, once all that is assembled, we can then start wrapping. So we take some pre-creased DSR, which is creased, as I said before, in order to tight, ensure a tight fit. And then we wrap up the scintillator, scintillator like so. And then we tape along the top. And then we wrap it with the TED bar from PMT to PMT, which you can actually see in a final version of the scintillator right there. Notice that the TED bar extends from one PMT to the other, and that ensures that no light comes in. We can also put wrappings on the end, ends of the PMT in order to ensure no light comes into the electric core. We need to make certain that no light comes inside the scintillator, other than the ones that are produced by charged particles. So once we have a complete scintillator, we can then begin testing it. Now we normally use, excuse me a second, um, we normally use uh, cosmic ray particles uh, for testing because they're very convenient. In fact, if you hold out your hand for every, about every second, one muon passes to your hand. Now these are relatively harmless to us, but they are useful in testing scintillators. So one test we do is the light tightness test where we take a complete scintillator and we put it in a light fit box like the one back there. When we take the top off the box and we see the noise and the signal, then we can take an opaque blanket or take a flashlight and look over parts of the scintillator too. And we can check to see if there are any light leaks in the signal and we can cover it with black tape. We can also check the signal output, the strength of the signal. And for that, we would actually change the, the uh, voltage applied to the PMT. So for a PMT, it, we can apply about 2,000 volts up to some of them. And that's what generates the electrical current. So that's what generates the electric field in the PMT. So if you adjust that, that changes the amount of the electrons that we produce in the dynos, which we can actually produce a about five uh, about 100 million times the greater signal than the initial signal. So another test we can do is time resolution, and for that we can potentially get a time resolution of about a tenth of a nanosecond, or ten to the negative ten seconds, and that's the amount of time it takes for a photon to actually travel three, mil, uh, three centimeters. Now, that leads us to actually assembling the uh, scintillating detector. So once we have all the scintillators, we can have some the detector. So here we have an image of one such scintillator detector called BAND. And you can see it has 116 scintillation detectors. They are very similar to the one that I just showed you before, but some of them have different lengths. They are stacked, one, stacked 18 scintillators tall and five layers deep. So that gives band dimensions of 130 centimeters tight, 36 centimeters thick, and 202 centimeters in across. You can see 24 veto scintillators up front. They're very similar to our regular scintillators, but they're thinner and they have only one P and T. So you can also see the hole in band. That's there to allow the Jepson lab electron beam to pass through band without hitting band. Band is held together by a stainless steel frame. And you can also see lead shielding on the target face. And that ensures that no low level radiation it's banned, so you don't want that. So a little bit of word about the thickness of uh, scintillator detectors because the, the thickness depends on what type of particle, what 
detect because scintillators detect charged particles differently than they detect particles with no charge, such as neutrons. So in a charged particle, uh, for charged particles, they detect scintillators detect charged particles directly because the charged particle interacts electromagnetically with the atomic electrons inside the material, which that ultimately produces the light that detect. However, for a neutron, it actually detects the scintillators detect the neutrons indirectly. The neutron has to actually get some of the material in the scintillator in order to produce a proton or a pion in order for that secondary charged particle to be detected on the scintillator on the light. So for a sector like band, it actually has to be much thicker than a normal charged particle scintillator because we need the actual nuclei for the neutrons to interact with it. So that's my talk about scintillators. Thank you for watching. All right. Uh, and with that, uh, we can go to Greg. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you. Perfect. Uh, so hello, everybody. My name is Greg Kalitze, and I'm a professor visiting here from uh, Catholic University of America and uh, working together in collaboration with Charles Hyde. And I will talk about uh, a part of nuclear physics for electron ion collider, but I will actually take you to area of research and area of measurements that you wouldn't expect the nuclear physics to go. Just to motivate it quickly, the electron ion collider that Sebastian mentioned already at the beginning of this, uh, of this panel, uh, it's an experiment that's gonna be built in not so far future, around 10 years from now, but we are planning it and working on it already for a number of years. It takes quite a lot of time to uh, build such a machine. The main reason why we are building this machine uh, is to solve several still uh, very tricky questions of physics. One of it is actually um, the, the aspect of mass and it's pretty cool problem. If you would take a proton uh, and kind of take it apart. It's actually just three quarks inside. But the problem is that if you would take these three quarks, if you could, and put them on a scale uh, and measure the, the mass, uh, the mass that it would, would show, the weight that it would show is just 1% of the mass of the proton. And so the question is where the rest of the mass comes from. And that's the question that the electron ion collider will try to answer. It comes basically from binding energy, from gluons that are holding them together over there but how is that happening? We really need to understand and the electron ion collider will help us to do. Here uh, on the poster, I will start quickly that for motivation. You can see actually the outline of how this accelerator will look like. On the right from it, you can see uh, two concepts of the detector that we plan to build. And as usual in these kind of big experiments, you have uh, beams that are colliding. Here there's gonna be an electron beam and a, um, ion beam and when they collide they generate in this big collision tons of tons of different particles and we have to figure out what kind of particles were generated and which way they are flying and so on and so forth and for that we need several different detectors it's, it's not so easy to make a photo of such a collision and so one of the detectors that we are working on and me in particular with Charles Hyde is a high performance dig detector. And so the simulation of such a system you can see here in the middle, uh, what it basically is, it's a number of uh, fused silica bars, basically quartz, uh, long rectangular bars that are arranged in this nice barrel. And the bars themselves, they are made of quartz. However, each of these bars uh, costs around $50,000. Why? Because you have to polish it to the quality of uh, surface smoothness on atomic level. So if you look on atomic level to it, it still has to be perfectly smooth. And that takes a bit of money. Now, how this detector works? Basically, if the particle goes through one of these bars, it generates a very small amount of light, but with very particular properties that are being conserved when this light is being guided to the side. And you can see it here. The, here is the particle, the light is being guided. It goes out to this small expansion volume also made of quartz, and is being imaged on this array of detectors. And if you move to the other side of the poster, you will see that's how the image would look like in such a detector. So you have three by four sensors that are able to detect single photons of light. That's not so simple. And from these very complicated images, we are able to reconstruct 
what was the particle that hit this bar and identify the particle. Now, one of the big challenges in this detector, and we are working on that uh, for quite some time now, is that this light has to be perfectly um, sharp. So these images have to be perfectly sharp. And for that, we need a very special uh, focusing. So we need to put a lens in there. Now, problem with the lens is that if you could take, for example, just a magnifying glass, a simple lens on a holder like that here, and so you can, you, you, you can take it and look on a piece of paper on your hand, and you can see that when you will get it in a certain distance, basically to the focal lens, uh, it's, in sh it's in focus and so it's sharp. Now, the problem is that if you would look from the side at it, it starts to be blurry, fuzzy, and that's aberration that is in the lens. And so it's kind of problematic because if our light in our detector won't go perpendicular straight to the sensor, but will go at some angle somewhere there, it gets out of focus and our beautiful images uh, are no longer in focus and we are lost. And so because of that, uh, for quite some time, we are now developing this uh, prototype special free layer lenses and the schematic of it you can see here below. And the idea here is that you have a first layer, a first uh, focusing uh, uh, transition and then defocusing and you go to the third layer and then from there you go to the uh, prism and you are nicely uh, focus on the on the detector. And so having these two surfaces that you are transitioning there and high refractive index um, middle layer of the lens allows you to shape the focal plane and basically makes it flat. What it means, it means that doesn't matter at what angle your light will go through the lens. So at what angle you are looking through your magnifying glass, it will always gonna be sharp at some distance. So that's the theory. Now the practice, you can see uh, here, and so for quite several years, we are building prototypes of these lenses, and you can see a few of them there. But actually, I will show you uh, also here in uh, person. So one of these lenses looks like that. And so you can see that's the first layer. Here inside, there's a second layer. And this figure is the third layer. So here is the bar. The light goes through here. And here is this prism, and here are uh, the sensors where we are focusing uh, our light. Now, as I mentioned, that's the theory. Uh, in practice, we need to uh, see if that really works. So we spent quite some time discussing with lens manufacturers uh, how to put in reality our uh, designs. Now we have to measure them. So how to characterize if your lens actually works as it should? <laughs> One of the methods is actually something that several of us for sure did as kids. And you can see a picture of it here. If you take a magnifying glass and use quite strong uh, uh, sunlight, if you have it in focus on a piece of paper, it will actually burn. So that's the moment where the light is the smallest uh, uh, kind of diameter of it. And so we tried to reproduce it uh, in, the, uh, in the setup that I will show you in the second. And so how it works, uh, if you will follow me here, uh, it's as follows. Uh, we are using uh, one of two lasers. Here is a nice red laser, and here is a nice green laser. And we, in original idea is that you want to put it through a lens, image it on the piece of paper or a CCD camera, and then look uh, where, if you would move the lens, where does it focus and how good does it look like? The theory is simple. The practice was not so easy. So me and Charles, we decided uh, we need the help of a second Charles, but Charles Sukenik, uh, chair of this department and uh, head of the atomic physics that you will hear next. And so with his expertise in, in, in optics and his um, uh, great uh, postdocs and, and students, we were able to build a nice setup where, as you can see here, with a bunch of uh, optical components, we we're able to have nice and beautiful round shape of the beam that uh, is going through the mirrors guided uh, here. And then at the end, it goes through the lens that is uh, being uh, held uh, from the setup here. And so in the setup, I'm able to rotate the lens that is imitating basically at what angle the light is going. Uh, so at what angle you are looking for the lens. And then on the other side of the uh, setup, you can see there sits the CCD 
camera and with this CCD camera, I can image how the beam looks like and I can find where it is the smallest, where is it being focused. Now you can see that everything sits in this weird tank. The question is why? Well, uh, the problem, and you could see it at the beginning, is that in the real setup or in the real detector, um, you are having a lens in between two pieces of quartz. And so we wanted to simulate this behavior because that changes how the lens actually operates. And <laughs> as cool as it is, actually the, uh, uh, the quartz that our detector is made of bends the light exactly the same as mineral oil. So what we did, we took a nice fish tank from the uh, fish store uh, and filled it up with a mineral oil. Uh, of course, everything has to be nice and precise. So uh, amazing uh, technician Tom Hartloff uh, from ODU helped to build this masterpiece of a setup. And so you can see that this tank is actually a nice uh, table that we can lower down and manipulate everything with the lens. Then we can put it up. Here you have a nice holder. And so on top of this holder, you can see there is a rotating stage. And so I can very precisely rotate the lens and uh, see at what rotation angle it is. Here I have nice measurement of at what distance uh, in Z position uh, the lens is away from the, uh, from the sensor that it sits here. And then I almost can measure. There's only one more problem. The problem is that what I should have, I should have a piece of paper as a screen here or my CCD camera. Now, because the CCD camera comes from uh, our great chair of the department, Charles Sukenik, and he's not so happy uh, to dip this great camera in, into the oil and see if it will still work. Uh, we need to somehow take the image from inside uh, the tank and image it on the camera outside. And here comes something that for me is mind blowing. Any of you that had already uh, some basic physics, probably when you talked about the optics, you had this a lot of weird exercises when you were drawing these arrows in front of the lens or a mirror and you were moving it and there was a race going through it. And usually you really don't know why in the world you are doing that. Well, here you can actually use it because if you come here for a moment again um, to, the, uh, uh, to the picture. So the idea from one of these drawings that you can see here is that if you place your lens exactly twice the distance from where it's focused the best, so in the second focal distance, the image of what you are placing there is gonna be perfectly on the other side, not changed, just rotated upside down. And so with help again of our optic friends, that's what we did. This big telescope, what it is basically, it's a lens that is uh, sitting in the middle uh, between uh, the CCD camera and the image that we want to see from here. And so it's adjusted. So it's exactly twice as distance in focal length from the, uh, of, the, of the sharpness of, of the image here. And so now what I'm doing is I'm having a lens here and I can image it on the CCD camera. Well, usually you want to know what you, what you want to expect. And so what we did, uh, we uh, collaborated with our friends from Germany and we come up with a simulation of such a setup. And so you can see here, there's a ray of light that goes through the lens. This is this three layer lens is being imaged on the screen. And so on the screen, we should see a nice round profile. So that's basically uh, our CCD camera, like a paper of the, uh, of the light. And so if you come here, I'm looking what I'm imaging from the setup with the green laser, and that's exactly looking like that. So now, if I take uh, here this nice sliding stage uh, and slide it a little bit to the right, uh, the image should get smaller. So if you will focus on there, I will keep on sliding it. I'm sliding it, sliding, sliding, and you see it becomes smaller, smaller, smaller until it will hit where is the focal length. So that's the minimum. And now I'm going out of focus and it becomes bigger, bigger, bigger again. And so if I measure that, I can simply take the setup, rotate the lens and repeat the same process. So uh, what I basically do in this uh, setup is uh, I'm setting specific rotation. So this is perpendicular case at the bottom here. And so I'm 
fixing the setup at a specific po position, and then I'm taking a measurement of the width of the beam, uh, move it a little bit, measure again, move it, mo measure again. And so the smallest point, that's the smallest diameter of the beam, will show me on this plot where is the focal length. I take this value for this specific rotation, I place it uh, on the uh, plot, and it sits here at 40 centimeters. Mine, this is millimeters, 400, uh, 390 millimeters uh, is 39 centimeters here. And so here you can see actually the uh, image simulation, how it looks like. If I would use a regular lens in front of this prism, the focal plane, so the dependence on the angle would be bended like that, which means I would only focus it good here. Everything else would be out of focus. Here you can see nice shape, uh, that is following the detector plane and my nice sensors. And you can see here, this is the data taken for this specific lens and it's nice and flat. And uh, that's exactly uh, what we wanted and that's how it works. And so as you can see, uh, I think this setup is pretty cool. It shows some of the cool stuff that I used to do as a kid and that used to bring me fun as a kid and that made me a dream to be a physicist. And on top of that, I'm doing my nuclear physics. I'm almost every day talking with atomic physics and get help with uh, with optics. And that's, that's what you get at ODU, uh, working with different uh, branches of physics and collaborating with different universities and just have fun like a child. Thank you very much. And so now you, I think that Charles uh, Sukenik will take it from there and talk to you about the atomic physics and fun stuff that they do there. Thank you. Great. Okay, well, thank you, Greg, uh, for that uh, description of the experiment. Also, thank you very much for not dropping my camera in the oil. I appreciate that. Uh, well, welcome and good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Charles Sukenik. I'm chair of the physics department here at ODU and coming to you live from uh, the Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics Lab, one of several that we have here in the department. And we sometimes call it the laser lab because as you'll see, we do a lot of work with lasers. A lot of the experiments involve lasers. So I'm going, I'm with uh, two of my graduate students, uh, Josh Fresham and Sterling Gordon, who are working on different projects. And I'm gonna hand off the uh, camera to Josh and flip the lens around. Okay, and kind of walk over here. And so you can get a, a better view of the entire lab. Um, the lab that we're in right now, we often call the ultra cold atomic uh, molecular physics lab. And that's because we use lasers to cool atoms down to close to absolute zero in temperature. And you might, this might seem a little bit strange to you because think of uh, using a laser to heat something up or to blow something up like you see in the, in the movies. But in fact, you can use lasers to cool atoms down or cool molecules down as well. So uh, how does that work and why do we want to do that? That's what I'm going to talk to you about today for just a few minutes, and then we'll show you some of the apparatus. Well, as you probably know, uh, light has energy. If you go outside uh, and you uh, are in the sun, you can feel the warmth. That's energy that is, that is coming from the sun and coming to you. But light also has momentum. And... We can use the fact that, that light has energy and momentum to tailor an interaction between the laser light. We have to have the laser tuned to uh, exactly the right wavelength and we can have it interact with atoms in such a way that the atom interacts with light. Some, there's this interaction, some light leaves and the light that leaves has a little bit more energy and a little bit more momentum than the light that came in. Well, where does that energy and momentum come from? It comes from the motion of the atoms. And if the motion of the atoms is getting less and less and less energy, it's slowing down. What does that mean if an atom or a molecule is moving slower? It means that it's colder. And we can use this technique to cool atoms down. We do it regularly in the lab here to almost absolute zero in temperature, about a hundred millionths of a degree above absolute zero. That's minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. Minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. That's really, really cold. So why would we want to cool atoms down to uh, such a low temperature or molecules for that matter? 
Um, well, there are a number of reasons. One is just basic science. That's one of the things that we do here in this lab and that we do in many of our labs uh, here at ODU. It's fundamental basic research. We know there's a lot that we don't know and we're trying to understand it. That's not unique to atomic physics. Uh, the, all the experiments you've heard about in nuclear physics, they're doing basic research, condensed matter physics, um, accelerator science, there's just basic stuff we don't know. And that's what we're trying to learn. Uh, but there are also applications for uh, a lot of the work that we do. So if we can uh, do an experiment where we're learning some basic science and we're able to maybe build an instrument or apply it somehow, uh, that's, that's even uh, more exciting. So when we make these cold atoms, um, we then do experiments on them. And we've done a number of different experiments over the years in this lab and some of the adjoining labs. Um, and I'll just give you kind of a, a, a quick overview so you get a flavor of the type of experiments that we do. Um, one of the experiments that we uh, did early on was to cool down different types of atoms. So one, if you think of the periodic table all the way on the, on one side, we, we have um, um, alkalis and all on the other side, we have uh, noble gases. And so we picked one atom from each of those columns and we looked at rubidium. Rubidium is kind of like sodium and we picked argon and argon is a sort of little, acts a little bit like, uh, like, like helium or neon. And we cooled them down and we studied how they interact with each other. And this was uh, to study fundamental interactions of these cold atoms. But we can do more than that because these atoms are traveling so slowly that we can do very precise measurements on them. So when atoms are moving at room temperature, like the atoms, uh, molecules in the, in the air, um, because of that motion, there's something called a Doppler shift. You're probably familiar with the Doppler shift when you hear like a train whistle. Well, that Doppler shift makes it harder to do precision measurements. It, it makes it, if I am using laser spectroscopy and I do a scan, I can't get quite the accuracy that, or the precision that I would get if they were just standing still. But if they're standing still, I'm able, I'm able to eliminate that uh, Doppler shift and it allows me to do very precise measurements. So that's an immediate application for having very cold atoms or very cold molecules uh, you can do precision measurements. It turns out to get cold molecules, it's harder to take a room temperature molecule and cool it down than it is to just take two cold atoms and put them together into a molecule. Although now the technology has advanced so much that there are techniques where you can start with warm molecules and, and make them cold as well. But some of the early work that we did was looking at cold atoms and putting them together and using light, this is called photo associative spectroscopy because photo, light, we shine light on the cold atoms and it causes them to come together and they can form a molecule. So that's another example of some of the work that we've done. What else? Well, we've taken these cold atoms and in other experiments and we've used pulse lasers to excite them to something called a Rydberg state. So what's a Rydberg state? You probably remember from your chemistry class you think of hydrogen, uh, the simplest atom, it has the, the nucleus, a proton, and it has an electron that circles around like this in a sort of a classical picture. If you give a little energy to that electron, you can make it circle in a bigger orbit. And so when you get to really, really big orbits, those are known as, as Rydberg state atoms. And so we uh, studied these cold Rydberg atoms. And in fact, some of these cold Rydberg atoms will ionize, meaning the electron just leaves all together. And what you end up with is a very cold plasma. Well, why would you want to study a cold plasma? Turns out it's related to astrophysics, because if you look at some of the celestial bodies, the way that uh, they behave um, is similar to how a, a very cold plasma would behave. So here's something where we're starting with just some atoms in the lab here, and we tried some laser on and make them cold, and we're able to do astrophysics. So that, that's really exciting also. Um, so it, to give you an idea, again, of how you make these atoms cold, think of a, a, of a bowling ball. And the faster the bowling ball is moving, that is, think of that as the hotter it is, and the slower the bowling ball is moving, 
think of that as, as being a colder bowling ball. So we associate the how much motion the bowling ball has with, with how hot or cold it is. And let's say you want to cool, uh, cool that bowling ball down. Well, one thing you can do is the bowling ball is coming toward you. You could throw a ping pong ball at it. And if the ping pong ball bounces off the bowling ball, it'll actually slow it down a little bit. Well, one ping pong ball isn't going to slow the bowling ball down very fast, but a million would. It's kind of hard to throw a million ping pong balls at a bowling ball, but you could throw a million photons at an atom. That's really easy to do. We can just shine our laser on it, and that's going to cause the atoms to cool down. So when you think of this laser cooling, as it's called, um, think of the bowling ball that's coming toward you. That's your atom. Think of the ping pong balls you're throwing at it. That's your laser. And if you throw enough of those ping pong balls or your laser photons, you can slow it down. We can do more than that, though. We can use that same laser if we tailor the magnetic fields in our apparatus properly to actually hold the atoms in space. You know, if I let go of something, uh, let's see, something that I don't mind dropping, and take this screw. I wouldn't drop. I wouldn't drop uh, Greg's expensive lens, but I. Well, there it is. I just dropped it. So I uh, I dropped the screw, and what happened? Uh, it fell. Why? Because of gravity. All right. So atoms do the same thing. They don't have as much mass, but they still experience gravity. So if you have an atom, it doesn't matter if it's hot or cold, it will experience a force due to gravity. But we can counter that force using the same laser that we use to cool the atoms down uh, to hold them in place. This is known as trapping or spatial confinement. And so regularly in the lab, we will cool down millions of atoms and we hold them in a ball that's about a millimeter in size and they just float in space and we do all of our experiments. Well, what are some of the other experiments that we've done that might be of interest and have applications? Well, again, going back to the Rydberg atoms, um, aside from the plasma stuff that I told you about, we've also done experiments where we look at how two Rydberg atoms, so we start with cold atoms, we use a pulse laser to get them into that big orbit, and we look at how they interact with each other. And one area of research that is of uh, particular interest right now in, in the field of atomic physics is looking at these cold Rydberg atoms, these highly excited atoms, as a way of making a quantum computer. So a quantum computer is a, a way of doing computation, not like your normal computer where you have a zero or a one for the bits, but using quantum mechanics. And uh, quantum computing is just, um, for some problems, just much, much, much quicker than uh, anything you could possibly do with a classical computer. So here again, we're starting with just these cold atoms, and yet it's, uh, it's related to um, quantum information science and quantum computing. Uh, we also have an experiment that Josh, the cameraman, is working on, is, um, is an experiment of looking at trace gas analysis using um, uh, krypton. And krypton is actually, you can find a little bit of it in the atmosphere. And you can do krypton dating just like you do carbon dating. So that, that experiment also involves cold atoms. What I'm trying to get across is that um, there's a whole range of experiments that we can do uh, using cold atoms that everything that whenever we do an experiment, we're doing basic research, but it has various applications as well. And I just want to um, uh, close and then we'll show you little introduction, then we'll show you some of the uh, apparatus by saying that not everything that we do in the atomic group, um, uh, in my group in particular, involves cold atoms. Um, so Sterling is working on a project uh, that's of interest to NASA to do supersonic and hypersonic flow diagnostics. So, you know, NASA puts a, a, a model in the wind tunnel, and then they want to look at the supersonic flow. Well, we're not gonna use cold atoms for that. That technique would not work, but we do use lasers for that. And so Sterling is working on a, a new laser technique for doing this um, supersonic and hypersonic flow diagnostics. So if you choose to go into atomic physics, the, the full area is called atomic, molecular, and optical physics. Sometimes we add the plasma physics to it also. Um, you get very versatile training in a whole range of techniques and apparatus and instrumentation and physics that you can then apply to a lot of problems that are of interest. They may involve cold atoms, they may involve uh, not cold atoms. Uh, often they involve lasers. There's lots of uh, uh, problems that involve lasers. I have another project with an oceanographer 
where we're building a LIDAR system. Uh, commercial, we have money to build a commercial system to study the vertical structure of the ocean. Not cold atoms, but it uses a laser. LIDAR is sort of like uh, laser radar. Another example of the broad training that you can get in, uh, in this area of physics that can then branch out in lots of different areas. So I'm gonna have Josh just kind of pan around the lab maybe. Um, and I show you this apparatus right here. This is one of our cold atom traps. We say trap again because we can spatially confine the atoms. What you see is um, a lot of uh, optics. So you saw some of these optics and mounts and various different components in Greg's lab. And this is a vacuum system. So we uh, stainless steel chamber, we take all the air out and then we put whatever atoms we're studying into the chamber. You can see it here. All of these optics are carefully aligned. This particular machine is actually called a beam machine. We um, make the cold atoms starting, we start by making an atomic beam. So think of a flow of atoms. And then when the atoms get to the science chamber, uh, we make them very cold. We also use lots of lasers. And so in this lab, we have, some of them are under boxes, but um, we have uh, what are called CW lasers. They're just on all the time or pulse lasers, nanosecond pulse lasers for the project involving the uh, both LIDAR and the supersonic flow diagnostics. We use pulse lasers. A lot of electronics. Let me get out of the way and I'm going to let, um, I'll let Josh kind of just pan through the lab and show you just some of the uh, other instruments that we have here, various electronics. Some of it is commercial. Uh, some of it is home built. When I first started the lab a few years ago, a lot of the electronics were home built by undergraduates. So undergraduates would build a lot of the controllers. Uh, over time, we've segued to a lot of commercial controllers, but we still build electronics. There's data acquisition that's involved. So as you can see, it's a very hands-on uh, discipline. And I've just shown you, you know, one aspect of it. Um, if you like working with your hands, and if you like working on a lot of different things, optics, lasers, vacuum systems, computer data acquisition, electronic circuits, whatever, this is a really, really great field to go into because you get very broad training in laboratory techniques. And in fact, um, I've had several of my students who graduated who have gone on to, well, they've, different students have gone to different jobs. Uh, some have gone in state and academia and they're now professors at uh, various universities or uh, one student is now at the uh, Air Force Academy. But I've also had students go into industry, including a uh, former student recently graduated is uh, working at Intel. Another student is working at Microsoft. Uh, another student's working for a company doing um, uh, laser work. So you get very broad training that uh, you can use in whatever direction you want to go in. So if, if you, again, if you like hands-on and you like broad training, atomic physics, I think, is the way to go. So that's my kind of quick overview of uh, some atomic physics that we're doing here. And I think I'm, I'll end with that. And I think we're going to, Rachel, I think we're going to go to a Q&A session, right? That is correct. And the first question is actually uh, for your group, Dr. Sukenik. Um, how do you ensure that atoms don't fly away during the cooling process? There we, okay, there we go. Uh, one second. All right, there we are, great. Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. So actually when we're cooling and trapping them, some of them do fly away. So when I talked about uh, having that collection of about a million or so atoms in about a millimeter, uh, we have not been able to cool and trap all of the atoms that are in the chamber. We only cool and trap a certain fraction of them. So some of them never get cooled sufficiently for us to confine them. But in addition, while they're being cooled, even though they're just barely above um, absolute zero, they're still moving a little bit. And sometimes they bump into each other and then they, one of them might get knocked out of the trap. So it's a kind of a continuous process where uh, atoms are coming into the trap and leaving the trap and being cooled. And 
depending on the type of laser that we use, we can keep them longer uh, than some other types. But that's the that's the, the the basic answer. It's a dynamic process. Thank you. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q and A part. Um, I went ahead and put in the chat the the nuclear um, presentation, so that is there. Also, um, my question for any and everyone that presented today is: um, How can one decide whether to get into nuclear or to get into atomic? Well, that's easy. You should just go to atomic, right? I mean, <laughs> um, uh, so. Dr. Kennick, I think you've got a phone call that you should answer right now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I will mute that presently. Um, uh, no, I will take that. So some, sometimes um, uh, people do not know what they want to do. They, they generally, we find that students have an idea that they want to do theory or experiment, uh, one or the other. Sometimes students want to do a little bit of both. But even within the areas of theory or experiment, they may not know what they want to do. So if you have an opportunity as an undergraduate to work in uh, with a professor in one or two different groups, um, that would be uh, really very, um, very helpful uh, so that you can learn what you like and what you don't like to do. You may be able to, um, you may be able to uh, work in several groups as an undergrad, and then you'll have a very good sense of what you like. If not, as a grad student, you also might have an opportunity to work in a couple groups and then decide, you know, what the best fit is for you. Yeah, I should wanted to just add that uh, both the undergraduate and graduate programs uh, give you uh, several years or at least a year to study or try out different options, both uh, experimental and computational and theoretical, but also nuclear or uh, um, atom atomic physics. So you actually don't have to decide before you even try it out. You, you try it out and then you find what's most interesting for you. Um, yeah, and I'm going to just add on to that. There are lots of internship opportunities, uh, specifically at Jefferson Lab, um, so check those out. But that's also for any area of STEM. Um, that gives you an opportunity to kind of really get some hands-on experience to figure out what is the best fit for you. Um, another question for Professor Sukenik, is a nanoparticle being trapped? Does it consist of millions or billions of atoms? Uh, so the nanoparticles are routinely trapped. Um, when you, it depends what temperature you're trying to trap them at. So when we talk about trapping nanoparticles, oftentimes we're not talking about trapping them at ultra cold temperatures. Um, the term that we use in physics is called the optical dipole force trap, but in biology, um, it's referred to as optical tweezers even though it's really the same physics that's involved. And so not only are nanoparticles being trapped and moved around with lasers, um, but you can move DNA around, strands of DNA and, and so forth. And in fact, um, the, this optical tweezer experiment, um, we have it here as an undergraduate experiment in the advanced lab where you can um, trap nanoparticles or even it, they don't mean nanoparticles, you can trap bacteria. So the first time we set up the experiment, uh, some of the students went out and took some of the pond water and put a sample of pond water in and they were moving little microbes around. Um, in general, what computational softwares are used for calculations of all data from the experiments? Maybe I can give it a start. So uh, in the case of uh, nuclear and particle physics, physics uh, these are huge experiments involving detectors with thousands and thousands of individual channels that are read out and analyzed. So it does actually require uh, computing farms and uh, advanced software uh, specifically written for uh, 
uh, for this purpose. Uh, for instance, the software called Root or uh, more general um, the program in Python and uh, Java. Uh, and so students actually who, who analyze data uh, spend some time learning these kind of modern software packages and then uh, applying them. Um, I guess it's a bit different for, for atomic physics. Um, yeah, we use different packages. It also depends a little bit. It depends on the experiment. Some experiments require a lot more uh, calculation than others. Some experiments we do, we can use Excel to, um, to do the analysis or C++ or Python, or um, if you grew up in a different generation, Fortran. Yes, I still use Fortran. Um, but some experiments really don't require massive uh, computation and Excel works fine to make a plot. I can maybe add quickly that in nuclear physics, what is pretty awesome is that because the collaborations are so big and there's so many scientists working on one experiment, you usually have a specific group that actually works just on the software. So even though you heard this uh, a little bit scary, maybe programming skills that need to be involved, but you learn it actually from people who love it, enjoy it and know it very well. So quite quickly, they, they can um, get you in it and, and sh share some code with you. And so you start um, not from, from nowhere. And so then you are at the end, you becoming master yourself of Root, which is basically an Excel, just uh, much better, much uh, faster and uh, can accommodate huge amount of data. All right, looks like we have one more question. What is the difference between atomic and particle physics? Which needs more research? <laughs> well, I think both need the, the same amount of research. Uh, I think that um, any area of physics, you can always find unanswered questions. So there's no area that there uh, needs more necessarily more research than another because there's so many unanswered questions. But the, to, to, the difference is, is often the energy scale. So for atomic physics, we're really concerned about how the electron behaves when it's circling, if you think in a classical orbit picture, when the electron is, cir is circling the nucleus, how does it behave and how does it interact with other electrons on other atoms and how does it interact with, with laser light? The, uh, Sebastian can talk about nuclear physics. They could care less about the uh, electron part of it, except if it's an electron beam. They're focused right in on the, on the nucleus, right, Sebastian? Uh, I mean, uh, nuclear physics is sort of in between. Um, there are still some labs uh, in, at universities, not here, um, where you can do nuclear physics in a lab, uh, a mid-sized lab, like a room this size. But uh, in general, nuclear physics and in particular particle physics is moving to larger and larger experiments because we do need to study uh, the nucleus with finer and finer resolution, and that means we need more and more energy. So we have international facilities uh, from right next door, Jefferson Lab, all the way to Europe at the CERN uh, Large Hadron Collider and uh, all over the world. So um, one difference definitely is that in particle physics in particular, you are more likely to work with a larger group uh, and on the other hand, you're also more likely to work um, with very complex equipment. I mean, clearly the laser lab that uh, Charles showed you is quite complex, but uh, if you think about a detector that is the size of a house and uh, every single detail is as fine grained or, or smaller than, than in, in the laser lab, uh, you, can, you can understand that this is, uh, well, it's very fascinating if you're so inclined to, to work with this. Perfect. Well, um, I'm sharing my screen, which has everyone's email on there. Also, there's a QR code. If you're watching this YouTube live, you can scan the QR code and get the presentation from the nuclear group. Um, if everyone could give me a virtual round of applause for all of our participants in today's tour. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day and join us for our next sessions. Thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. And don't forget, you can always send us email.
the emails are in that uh, presentation that you just shared.